four, three. We'll do it live. Yeah. Now we're live. <laughs> Aaron Kennedy, the general craziness of it, the impact on your life. We have gone through so many stories, and we said, you know what? This should not be kept to the two of us. Hi, Megan. Hi. You know what's crazy? I just what? looking at that intro that you just played, Erin, and we have remained like with the same kind of look. Like once you find something that works, you stick to it. You know that what I'm is saying? true. Except I did cut my hair recently, and this would have been against code because I cut four <laughs> inches off. Right. So that would have had to have mm -hmm. been approved, and mm -hmm. it probably wouldn't have been because it wouldn't oh, have been consistent with my brand. Who would you be? Uh, as Marissa said, I, I would have turned into a purple towel when they hired a white towel. <laughs> and I say, but I still would have dried your body. So it would have been fine. the same way. You know how it is. Oh, I am so, excited about today, Erin. Me too. Me too. And again, this is by popular demand. Since we started chatting, Megan, there were a lot of people whose names came up from viewers who they really wanted to hear from. And top of that list was always Chicago legend, decades in the market. We both worked with him, Megan. Everybody knows him. We would like to give a very warm welcome to the one, the only Rob Johnson. Hey, Rob. Hey. Good to see you all. Thank you so much for having me on. I bet you give that introduction every week. <laughs> We don't. <laughs> we got a legend this week, and it's well, this week and fill in the blank. No. <laughs> yeah, but Rob, it's so good to see you. Um, you were always at the top of my list as well. I think yeah. everybody recognizes you. They know you, and people who know you well know that you are just such a great guy. I just want to share quickly my story of like when we first worked together, which was before I was even technically on air. I was just coming to Chicago for the first time. Kate Sullivan couldn't make an evening event. So I was filling in for her. I had just had my baby. I was living in temporary housing. I show up to this huge event and you took me aside and you were so kind and you went around to introduce me to all like the power players who were at that event, which I thought was so kind because not only is it important when we do the work that we do to know all the people, but it's also rare, Rob, to find people who make sure that the new talent kind of landed on their feet. So I always, that always sticks with oh. me and I think you're the best. Well, thank you. And I, I think that was the, was that the Mario Tricocci, the um, make me yeah. a model thing? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, listen, we're all nomads, right? We've all been all over the place working in this business or having worked in this business. And we all remember what it's like to be the new person. We've all been yeah. there. And so it's just the least, you know, that, that I could do. And it's like, listen, you know, you're part of the team. You want people to feel good about being part of the team. And, and for me, that was always really important. And for, you know, I, I worked really hard on trying to build that. And then there's external forces that kind of maybe work against that. But for me, it was always like, okay, we're on the team together. I want you to feel good about being on the team together. And I want you to know, I'm not going to be sitting here working against you. I'm going to be working yeah. with you and for you. I mean, because um, that's not exactly how a lot of people think. Yeah, that's rare. But, but it's, um, I think it was important. And, and listen, I'm not doing this anymore. None of us is. But um, to have the longevity I had, especially at the place that we all worked was, I, I felt like, gosh, that was, that was a pretty good run. It was, mm -hmm. you know, 13 years in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's pretty rare. So I'm, I'm grateful for it. And, and all the viewers and everybody that went along uh, on the ride with us, I'm always grateful for them. And for me, it was always about, it was, I mean, it's so hard when we all put on makeup and we're dressed to the nines and this and that, not to, it, not to make it about us, but to me, it's always, it's always been about the experience for the viewer. It's the experience for the customer mm -hmm. now, you know, doing what I do now. So I'm never, I never lose sight of that, uh, no matter what business I'm in. So yeah. Rob, what business are you in now? <laughs> what so, you doing? So after um, after leaving the the old place, I I'd had an LLC set up for a children's book I wrote, and I was like, and I had told my agent, find me a really good job in TV, and I'm really looking hard at like corporate America, consulting, whatever the case is. If you get me a really good job, we're good, and and it, it didn't even come close. So I was like, I really would like to try this other uh, thing. And so long story short, because I know we only we don't have that much time, but but I went into uh, communications consulting and I thought I'll take everything I learned from our business, you know, having watched the good, the bad and the ugly. And unfortunately, I think in some cases 
having to be out front for some of the good, the bad, and the ugly as it related to marketing and messaging and communications yep. and things of that nature. So I started doing that, started my business six months before COVID. It was all oh, great. Great timing, Rob. <laughs> like if I knew somebody says the worst pandemic since 1918 is coming your way, I'd be like, Maybe I'll just go hide under a rock. I mean, who knows? Right? TV. <laughs> and I mean, but but so much of this now, like, you know, so many meetings occur like this. So for my best client, I was sitting there like, okay, I was doing all this in person, you know, these seminars and branding and marketing and things of that nature. How do I do it remotely? Well, remote presentation skills. And then everybody would say, ah, I don't need these because we're going back to the in-person meetings in no time. No, nope. which to a degree, a small degree is true. But all the bosses figured out, you know what? I don't have to fly them there. They don't have it's to so whine and whine the yep. clients. They don't have to, you know, do all that. We can do it. You don't like even this. have to put on pants. You don't even have to put on pants. <laughs> I did listen. I think so much of both of you. I did put on pants today. So I really <laughs> oh, you're so fancy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. In shorts. We are honored. I in shorts, but I did pants. So <laughs> but we will accept that. So um, I have a question though, Rob, because like yeah. You know, you were in the industry for so long, just like Aaron, just like I was as well. So what was the one thing that made you go, yeah, I am not going back in? Was it just that you couldn't find the perfect job or did you not want to jump back into the frying pan kind of a thing? Well, no, I, you know, listen, and my wife said, you know, the business isn't, you can't, you can't make it analogous with that one place, but I did. And it was just, I just didn't enjoy it. It just wasn't fun. And there was so much backbiting. There's so much negativity and, and, you know, just having to, and the other thing too, you know, I'm a little bit older than both of you, but, but at this level, I mean, I dreamt for years. I was like, you know what I'd love? I'd love to be able to work from anywhere. I got my hiking boots on and my jeans and I'm in the mountains somewhere. And all I need is my laptop. And I just had that vacation like three weeks ago in Montana with my family. It was our last little hurrah before everybody gets back into their thing, right? And for me, it was such a joy. I could still have meetings. I could still do it. And so that it was way in the back of my mind. And then all of a sudden it moved up and I was like, you know, and then my son, um, the last two years played hockey in Detroit. This year, he's playing junior hockey in Wisconsin. We're able to go and watch a lot of the games. We're able to be flexible. And as you know, in that business, that's the least flexible job that's out there. You right, you do right. have to look your best, especially, I mean, for you all having to wake up, listen, it was one thing to come at two in the afternoon and try to, you know, get myself, you know, tie and, you know, and make up and everything. I mean, you guys had to do it at like two in the morning, <laughs> right. which is just unbelievable. And you're women because, so the rules are different. Everybody expects right. women always to look perfect. I mean, I can look like a schlub and people go, hey, he's on, he's on. talk about that though, Rob. <laughs> I mean, you had to have seen that in your career. Like you sat next to a bunch of very powerful TV uh, anchor women, right? Yeah. But like, did the rules feel different between what you were dealing with and what they were dealing with? Did you notice that? Oh, it was, it was so noticeable. And it's such an unfair double standard because I feel like if I'd wanted to, I could still be I could still be doing this and it would be fine and no problem. I felt like women would go, oh, gosh, I'm 41. I'm 46. Uh oh, I just hit 50. And it was like, mm, no, thanks. And I would see some of the men come into work, you know, some of the reporters, especially that look like they I mean, I don't know where they got their clothes and, <laughs> and they had zero style. They could come in and have zero style and look like hell. And everybody's like, we're good with that. And yeah. a woman could have like, like two hairs out of place. And they're like, what the hell is wrong with her? So yeah. I saw it all the time. And I always thought it was really unfair yeah. because there was a double standard. I always tried to look my best and do my best. I don't know that I got there every single day. I don't know that any of us do, but there was such a double standard to the way that I had to look versus the way that you all would have to look. Yeah. And especially um, Rob, on the morning show. I have a very important question. Yeah. Did you sign an NDA? An NDA. Um, I don't recall signing an NDA. I, I don't understand like, why Megan and I had to sign this, and I feel like other people didn't. Maybe it was a cold. No, I mean, you know, I might find out after this when it airs that people are like, <laughs> <laughs> the lawyer and that's knocking on the door. No, um, we have nothing negative to say. I was yeah, just curious. I, there, there was so much stuff that was curious about that. 
And there were so many things that I didn't like. And there's, and there's, you know, and, and it's not like, and I always tell people this, um, when I, whenever I say something that's not glowing about the business, I say, I don't want to bite the hand that fed me for so long. It fed yeah. me and my family for a long time. And yeah. I am eternally grateful for what it did for me when it was good, when it was no good anymore. I'm uh, like, why would I want to? And, and then of course I was thinking to myself too, not even having the double standard of a woman, but I thought as I get older and as I get grayer, then they're going to be like, Hey Rob, want to be, you know, the weekend morning anchor. I mean, and I'm not disparaging anybody who has that job. I'm just saying okay. being the main anchor and then realizing I've seen, I've seen the long descent into irrelevance for people in our business who hang on and hang on and hang on. And that's what I was, I was so scared of that. Same. I was like, I got to pivot. I got to do something else. So I'm a hundred percent with you. I, a friend and I made a pact like way back. We were like, 22 years old in Miami. And we said to each other, we literally shook on it. Okay. Like in the depths of night in a weather center, she was traffic. I was weather. And we we're like, we are not riding the train back no. down. No. Like period. End of story. Yeah. I didn't want to do it. Being said, Rob, you, you still had to get kicked off the merry-go-round, right? Otherwise yeah. you'd probably still be there now. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I suppose if somebody had said, Hey, you want to do this for a third of the money you were making, I might've said, I nope. think I can do better. <laughs> so maybe, right. maybe it would have, maybe it would have been different, but your, but to your point though, Aaron, I mean, yeah, we were kicked off the merry-go-round pretty unceremoniously. <laughs> Megan and I on the same day. No, no, Marissa and I on the same day. Yes. I can't yeah. keep yeah. them together now. There's so many of them. Anyway. I know, I know. But, I know. But well, I didn't yeah. want to, uh, but the to your point, Megan, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go on that long descent. And I didn't want to have to always report for duty and never get to watch my kid try to achieve his goals and dreams. And the, 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 the happiest it makes me, and I tell people all the time, for me being the, the main breadwinner in my family, you know, eating what you kill is a huge change. I mean, you go from W-2s, I know how much I'm getting paid every week, no, no, no more, no less, but I know exactly what it is. And now it's a little loosey-goosey. You know, three and a half years into it, I'm used to it now. And I'm able to handle it. And thank goodness business is going well. And I've got a lot of clients and I've got a lot of people lined up to do work with. So I'm very grateful for that. But um, it takes a while to get used to. The flip side is people say, how do you like being an entrepreneur? I'm like, I love it. I love the different projects. And for those of us who were in front of the camera and, you know, they would say, oh, great show today, Aaron. Hey, great weather cast, Megan, uh, or great election coverage, Rob, or whatever the case was. And I'd be like, oh, thanks. I get so much more of a kick. Yes. And, and, and I'm sure, Aaron, you can relate to this as well, doing what you do right now, trying to elevate people and trying to tee them up um, to, to, to do great interviews and to really explain what they do in the marketplace and financial marketplace, no less. So, so for me, I get so much more of a kick out of giving people good advice, watching them execute it and watching people go, wow. And you're I, building I, I, something. Yeah. You're yeah. building something because that's the one thing that I always thought about. It's like you could work your butt off, have the most difficult day, like a crazy weather day or an insane election or whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, it was gone and done. And there was not a whole heck of a lot to show for it unless you had a recording somewhere. And then you move right. on to the very next day. But now like you can build something and see that continue to build and get you know, better and nurture it and grow it. But I guess like my question to you is when Aaron and I got popped off the, the ride, it was like a trip of like, how do I redefine myself kind of? And I don't even feel like I really was ever defined by being Megan, the meteorologist, but there was a segment of me that was like, wow, I got to figure out who I am again. I have to get to life outside of TV. Like, what was that part like for you? Well, I, I think I, I should start that answer by saying, and this is absolutely the truth. I could, when I was doing TV, if I walked down the streets of Chicago or if I was in a restaurant and no people said hello or 10 people acted like Oprah just showed up, yeah. my day was exactly the same. It didn't, I wasn't like, oh my gosh, I just walked down the street and I was walking with Aaron and Megan and nobody said hi to me. Like I, <laughs> that never mattered to me. me like either. I got it. Like people yeah. come up, say hi, they're, 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 you know, sort of you know, um, helping you, you know, help, help give you a sense of what I do, you know, is important to a degree because people are responding to it. Okay. Yeah. But it never made or break my, would break my day, make or break my day. So having, so having set that up, it wasn't as hard as it might, as you might've thought. I will say this though, 
the thing that's been the most interesting to me is my network of people because yeah. my network of people prior was all these really important people. I knew them. I had them on speed dial. I could do whatever. <clears throat> and then when I got in the real world, a handful of them were very helpful. In fact, my best client right now um, is, is, you know, the, 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 the former CEO was the first guy to give me a job doing what I'm doing now. So I was able you know, to, to have people help me. I was always into helping other people. My network now is filled with people who are givers, who are dynamic, who are like, what can I do to help you? I'm on a call with you, Megan and Aaron. And I'm like, what introductions can I make for you? What can I do? When we get off the phone, what can I do for you? Right. These are the people I talk to now. My old network of people was very powerful and it had bold face names and all that kind of stuff. When it came though, I helped them all the time. I would do all these charity events and I realized, they're the, the dinner chair and I'm helping raise lots of money and I'm you know good at doing all these events and everything. It was kind of maybe a one way, maybe it was a one way relationship. And yep. so I learned that about myself that to me, harder than people not knowing who I was or various other things or not being the TV guy anymore. It was far that, that mattered far less to me than understanding, oh, my network. I thought it was really good. And people look at it from afar and go, man, you have a really good network of people, good friends. And, you know, they were okay. Yes and so no. now the group is, now the group are people that are really dynamic, successful, um, a lot of more entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, but people who are willing to help. And, and I will say one other thing about the, the, the jarring experience of not doing that anymore. And it wasn't the TV thing again. It was people that were like some of my best friends, like just friends, really? not, not business acquaintance, but best friends. And all of a sudden it's like, and how do I, how do I interpret it after, after doing stuff with them all the time? And then all of a sudden you see them maybe twice a year. Hmm. Can you interpret the fact that maybe not, you know, I, it's a lot less exciting to hang out with a non TV guy than it is to hang out with a TV guy. Yeah. Perhaps. It really cuts through to who's who was really there for the right reasons, you know. Yeah. The shine has worn off of Rob Johnson. That's <laughs> oh why I'm not wearing makeup today. <laughs> um, Rob, I want to ask you a question that came up a, a couple of times. Like I said, as sincerely as people were requesting that we speak with you, yeah, um, how it felt to go through working with so many female co anchors who were, you know, laid off and laid off or not renewed. I mean, I went through the same thing. Oh my God. Um, I went through 700 teams. Right. How <laughs> I was like, last man to, ten to times. have longevity on the desk. And to me, I, I likened it when I was explaining it to Megan to a little bit of like survivor's guilt. It's like, you of course want to have your job. You feel bad for the people who were let go, but you're always hoping like, all right, well, maybe this one's going to stick. Yeah. The hardest part was and, and not to bring up personalities or anything of that nature, they they ran through three people in a row who came from outside the market. Everybody in Chicago who wants to be successful in television knows. And I had to work eight years of weekends at ABC as a report, as an anchor and a weekend. I mean, it's a weekend anchor and a reporter. You, you got to let people get to know you. Yeah. And at the old place, that was not the model. And it was like, I think you could come in on a morning show and be like, Hey, here's a new person. That's fine. Throw somebody on the hot seat, the 10 o'clock news in Chicago. You don't know Buffalo Grove from Morton Grove. I mean, you, you don't know from Long Grove. You don't know any of these, this stuff. You don't know where the streets are. You don't have any institutional knowledge and it shines through when you're presenting the news. If you've never been out there, when I would start at ABC, it was, Hey, you're a three day a week reporter. So I got to learn all those places naturally. And then I would anchor the news on the weekend. And then when I had a chance to, to, to jump to the other station, I, um, I already had that institutional knowledge. And by that time, people quit saying, where are you from? Where are you from? And for years, I'm here. And then after a while, like I've been in Chicago now 24 years. And I say, people are like, where are you from? I'm like, I've never li lived anywhere longer than here. I'm like, I'm from here. You know, my right kid now. was born here. Yeah. Um, my wife and I didn't get married here, but we were married while we were here. So that's, you know, so, so I'm from here. Yeah, that's significant. To answer your question, though, it's, it, I think it was unfair to put people on the hot seat. And what happens is, in, in my estimate, this is one man's opinion, okay? So I'm not speaking for everybody. I would, you know, I, I told you earlier, Aaron, when you were referencing the, the event before you even started, listen, I want, 
I want the person sitting next to me to be successful because that right. means my show is going to be successful. That means yep. people are going to like me. That means my ratings are going to go up and I'm going to have you know a better chance Job security. for success. Job security. Yes. Yeah. And that wouldn't happen. And then, and then I think there would a level of frustration would set in with, with, uh, with some of them because it was frustrating because not that I was like, it wasn't like working next to Bill Curtis. Cause I mean, the guy's a legend, but I'd been yeah. here long enough and people knew me and they were comfortable with me. And they're like, who's that? Who's that? And I think there, uh, there was enough of that. And then all of a sudden the internal relationship can sort of fray a little bit. And I'm, yeah. and, and, and to me, that was the same thing that happened over and over and over again. So then people would say, oh gosh, Rob can't work with women or and then people wouldn't say that, but there was like this undertone of like, oh, how come Rob's there? And they keep blowing out all the females and I didn't like it. And I didn't really see any way out of it. And I can tell you as I started my own business and there, none of it ever, it never came up because it never should have come up. But, but I will tell you that I, when I work with respectful and kind people, I do that times 10. And so I am always respectful. I'm always kind to anybody, not just a woman or a man or, you know, whatever. Um, but it was, but I'm really glad that I'm in the position I'm in now because I work with lots of people. I actually partner with several um, P, um, strategy agencies and women are the CEOs and, and I love working for them and with them. Yeah. And so, so for me, I think the frust, you know, and I'm glad that you asked this question and it's probably a longer answer than you want, but I, it was just really frustrating because you can't put a newbie on the hot seat. Yeah. You can't do it. Well, it doesn't I have them up for success necessarily. And then you have to deal with the ups and downs of what happens because they weren't set up for success. That's right. the hard part. Like something, I think there's something magical about having a wonderful on-air team of people who blend and mesh, but it's not always going to happen when you just fling some people together. You, you it needs to grow organically, you know? Um, yeah. And, 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 and the thing is for these bosses, they wouldn't even do like, there was never even a, uh, there was hardly ever a, you know, a screen, a little test, you know, uh, you know, where, where you'd sit next to each other and do that sort of thing. I mean, it would be like, no, that's, that's who it is. And you're like, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah. okay. And, and for people that haven't been in this business and you all understand this as well as anybody, I always wanted to work with somebody that elevated me that, that was like the, the better you are, the higher energy you are, the more engaged you are, the more engaged I am. And then I'm going to raise it up and then you're going to raise it up. And then this is how it's supposed to be. And I can't tell you how few people I worked with that actually ever did that. Is that, is that an indictment of them? No. Is it an indictment of me? I don't think it, I mean, I think everybody shares responsibility, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. But to me, that was the most enjoyable way to work when you're elevating each other. And, yeah, yeah. And you're right. Like to, it actually used to make me giddy as, okay, as a weather person, it's a little different because for you guys, you were sitting next to someone for hours at a time and you're having to deal with uh, the ad-libbing in between all the stories. But for me, it, that was so highlighted by how an anchor would toss to me yeah. because there's a way to throw it away so you can go take a potty break and there's a way to really like own it. And that was just like when I would get an awesome toss, which allowed me to be me and lead into weather in a smart way. It was like, uh, it was like Christmas morning, but right. not everybody took the time to do it. Right. Not everybody's, listening. not everybody's paying attention to what's going on yeah, right, right in front of them. And yeah. for me, whether it was a sports toss or a weather toss or engaging the other person, I'm teeing you up and, you know, we worked together probably five times in five years. Right. I mean, so we never got a chance to really work together, Megan, but, and, and, and Aaron to, you know, this, the same idea it's, um, but teeing, teeing you all up to be successful was always like, okay, good. And somebody say, man, great sports toss or great weather. And it's like, I'm just listening to try to let people know yeah. how I'm paying attention and to, and to let you get a little momentum as you're going on to do your weather forecast or somebody's mm -hmm. doing the sports cast. I also think part of what a, makes a great team too, okay, and this would be like removing a little bit of the ego from each person, but I think yeah. it's critical. I, I want to know your opinion. I always found the best teams to be the one where someone is willing to be, and it doesn't have to be the same person all the time, but someone's willing to be a little self-deprecating to help pop the other person oh. up. And that just builds right through the day, through the show, through the weeks. I love that. 
Because, like, and I'm willing to do it. I'll make myself look like a fool for anybody. <laughs> but, but think about it. Think about how rare that is, though, Megan, because because yeah. people are sitting there like, oh my gosh, I did all this prep, and now I, I look perfect, and my makeup's great, my hair is great, and all that. And I get on, and I want to be perfect. And the yeah. thing is, I always knew that if you were imperfect, that you were going to relate more to the viewers because all of them are imperfect, just like we are. And yeah. so, for me, to your point, I couldn't agree more because it's so true. If you're willing to have a little fun at your expense or, oh, I did something goofy or, you know, whatever, all of a sudden it takes down the intensity level. Yeah. Takes the ego. The ego. Bit. Like does just the formality of it, you mm -hmm. know, uh, of being behind a desk and here's the news and, blah, 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 <laughs> you know, but those aren't the things you remember. Nobody's going to say, hey, I love that story you read on the house fire. That was awesome. <laughs> You're going to say, oh, my God, you said. <laughs> really that nailed that read. Yeah. yeah. No, why? No, Siri can remember. read that. Yeah, Siri yeah. can read that. Okay. If Siri can read it to you, then you ain't giving them anything special. Exactly. exactly. Um, Rob, so before we get into our questions, I have one more question that I wanted to ask. It's kind of generic, but very common in the industry. I feel like you had, you know, some real special sauce at channel seven in Chicago and you know, there was a shine on you. And so then, you know, you're kind of poached by another station, hoping that you will bring that, you know, fairy dust with you. And sometimes that doesn't translate from station to station. And the stress of that is what I want to know. What does that feel like when kind of people are putting something on your back? When, in my opinion, the success of a show that it's just so hard to be responsible for the success of a show, even if you're coming off of a successful show across the street. Well, this is, this is the other thing too. So I could say when I worked at ABC, it's Sunday night on ABC, most watched newscast of the week. So I only did two days a week, but one of those nights was the most watched of anybody. So mm -hmm. I always had that like, oh, I have that. And then I get a chance um, to go and, and, and be the guy. And we had our ups and downs and we had some stops and starts, but there was a period of time there. We had, and, and people forget this. They're always like, oh, you know, the old place was in the, you know, crapper forever. And it wasn't. We had three years of of year-to-year uh, -year ratings growth. We had 36 months of this. And then all of a sudden, it's like, ah, oh, let's cool it off or this. Or what? So, so all of a sudden, external forces make decisions that you might not think are the smartest, mm -hmm. and they weren't clearly. And they start tinkering with it, and then it goes down. And then it's like, but we want our audience back, but not that good. Mm -hmm. and, and so for me, it was, even though it wasn't a winning environment, and even though I came from a winning environment, I had enough winning there, enough progress there that I knew if they would let me do what I can do in, in concert with other talented people, we can do well. Mm -hmm. The fact that they didn't wasn't on me. So I never felt like, I don't want to say loser. I didn't feel like I was a loser walking in the door because I felt like I did everything I could to put them in a position to win. The fact that they at the time chose not to, um, and you bang your head against the wall, right? With management groups and whatever, um, that wasn't on, I, I felt like that wasn't on me. So I could compartmentalize the fact that I'm not getting the results I want, but I still walk in here today and I feel like I'm a winner. I feel like I'm going to do a great job and I feel like I'm going to do the best that I can. And people are going to say, man, that guy's really good, despite the fact that I might be working somewhere where that, that is not a shared goal. And mm -hmm. as it related to coming from ABC and going there, or I always was mindful of building my personal brand. I mean, I did 75 events a year and I'm on, and I'm yeah, still on busy. four boards. I mean, I was on three boards at the time. Now I'm on, they're like, oh, you have more time now. I'm on four charity boards right now. So that's just always been something that was really important to me. And it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't, you know, trying to be cynical and I'm going to build my, um, but it was just something that was important to me, but it helped build my brand despite the fact that the brand that I was working for you know, had its difficulties. <laughs> well said. All right. So Rob, some questions for you here. Share your craziest story with us. Okay. My craziest story. And people are like, this was your first job. This was Alexandria, Louisiana, 1990. I'm 22 years old and they're, they're doing the, the champion. So people are like crazy story championship steer, 1200 pound steer, some 12 year old kid won it the day before at the 4-H fair. They're bringing the steer and the kid down to the studio for the morning show. It's called Jambalaya. And it was this little low, you know, small market, low rent morning show. And it had like three people on it. So I was doing 
so first of all, before the steer got in there, it ran loose. It got away and ran loose in the streets of Alexandria, Louisiana at six in the morning for like 30 minutes and people are chasing it and everything. So that's <laughs> the visual. That's funny enough. The steer gets in there. So I'm having to deal with a 12 year old who's Mr. One word answer. And, and even at 22, I'm like, I know not to ask yes and no questions. I know, hey, tell me what the experience was like, you know, when your steer won, good. Oh, geez. <laughs> so in the middle of the most deadly interview ever, all of a sudden I hear, <laughs> and I'm like, what is that? And all of a sudden I hear all the, you know, back when we had camera people behind the cameras in the studio, you know, back in the old days. Right. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's going, and I'm like, what is it? What is it? I'm like, I'm sitting there, there's a kid, there's a steer. The steer is pissing on the AstroTurf that we laid. <laughs> Hopefully we laid down AstroTurf, but in the yeah. middle of the worst interview ever with a championship steer, with a 12 year old who won't talk, I had a steer going piss on live TV. I think yeah. that is the best. <laughs> yes. And I had a cow, a cow patty bingo that we played live on the Parkersburg morning show, by the way. That was oh my God. Parkersburg, Alexandria might as well have been the same place. <laughs> yep. I, I did it too in Lubbock, Texas. So yes. <laughs> All right. Craziest viewer letter or comment? Craziest viewer letter or comment? Um, somebody hey, was hey, wait, time, real quick. Did you get jail mail as a man? Um, I did. I did. I got very little, very okay, little of sorry, it. Sorry, continue. Thank you. Um, and I know that all of you got it like fifty, you know, letters a week. So yeah. I got, I got very little of it. It's, it's always, you know, weird. What, what, what can you say? Yeah. I think. Um, I think probably a view a viewer letter like somebody who knows that you're you know on TV knows that you're married knows whatever is like oh I really think you're you know cute and I you know if you ever have a chance I like to go out sometime and I'm like I'm like you know I don't sit around talking about my marriage on TV all the time but like like are you not aware of this <laughs> or, pass. or or that or or critiques of I think also, and, and and you guys can speak to this way more than me, but whenever I would get a critique about my hair or, you know, when I was in my thirties and I had my, my hair wasn't spiked up, but it was sort of like up like this a little bit more, but it probably was a little, you know, whatever stickier looking. And they'd be like, oh, you know, at your point in your career, should you be doing this? And I was like, who are you? Like, what? <laughs> so, so those were some of the, the weird ones, but I don't even think that I, could even come close to getting weird ones like you got because yeah, they, they again, are fun. I, I wish I'd kept them all men, for a coffee men, table. The book. double standard between men and women uh, on TV, right? Yeah, yeah there's yeah. another example of it right there. Yeah, yep. most dangerous assignment. Oh, no question. It was uh, covering. I was at ABC and it was covering Hurricane Katrina. Chuck Gowdy goes down. He's reporting, you know, during the hurricane, and then after about eight or ten days they switched us out and I went down there because I'd worked down there and going through Louisiana, having to navigate myself through, you know, water that was toxic yeah. bodies that are floating around um, gun stores that had been looted by people. So I would do an interview. I remember doing an interview on an amphibious vehicle one time. And I had, um, I had like three snipers in there with me, like ready to, they were looking at rooftops because they had, because the gun store had just been looted the night before it was lawlessness or, or a, a medevac um, helicopter crashes and all the medical supplies wiped out. It was just that whole thing is something I will never forget. And, and having to stay two hours away in Baton Rouge and having to navigate our way into Jefferson parish every day and to have to pay um, bribe money to get in there because it's Louisiana and just everything about it was so unusual. And then the other thing that broke my heart was having spent my early days of my career in, La in um, Alexandria and Lafayette was I remember when it was great. Right. And right now right. it's not great and it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And it's, and we're, and, and just walking down the streets. I remember walking down the like street in the ninth ward and it's, and it's, I'm working at ABC, Jay Levine's at CBS and we're going and, and, and with our um, photographers, we're going door to door and seeing, you know, okay, this body's going with the um, Chicago police. All right, this house is clear. Or they put it, you know, an X, it was okay. Or there's a, there's a body in here, you know, whatever. Obviously, we wouldn't go in and take video of it. But that was so just, this is happening in our country. So that, to me, was my most dangerous assignment that I- You went down uh, with CPD? What's that? You went down with CPD? 
uh, we met them down there. I went, we, all the stations went down there, but then they're like, hey, CPD is going to be down there going door to door in the ninth ward at 10 o'clock. Oh, you were covered. Oh, okay, you were like embedded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we Who were hired embedded. the snipers? What's that? Who hired the snipers? Oh, that was federal government stuff. They were protecting you. Was I like mean, it was like FEMA, federal government. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought that they would be protecting reporters down there. Um, well, we were interviewing their person. So they were, yeah. So I'm not sure they were I so see. worried about protecting me. They were probably more worried about protecting <laughs> Right. Me. Okay. That makes more sense. <laughs> interviewing, interviewing one of their, their right, top right. FEMA guys. I know. And, I'm and, picturing Rob riding in an amphibious vehicle with like Navy SEAL I'm thinking, snipers. I'm like, Dave, how do you get Rob that? to get three crazy. snipers and watching his back? The other crazy thing about that one particular trip too is like, you're in an amphibious vehicle. There's nine feet of water. And cars look like matchbox. They just look like little toy cars. Yeah. They're just bouncing off each other, bouncing off each other. And then you'd see a body floating, you know, like a couple blocks away. And um, and uh, Dwight Payne, who I work, who uh, who I knew in Lafayette, and then he ends up being a photographer at ABC for many years. He's sitting there, you know, shooting video. You're not going to miss that video, right? We're not sitting there zooming in and being macabre or anything. But you're shooting, and they're like, "Oh, there's a floating body uh, at ninth and whatever." I mean, and they're like trying to remove it. And the, and the saddest part to me too was like, this is a heavily African-American um, area and the body been in the water so long, it was bleach white. It was white as a ghost. Mm. And, and you're just like, this is America. This is America. That was, and, and honestly, I had a friend from the Chicago fire department. I do a live shot, you know, four to six inches of water in, in, um, you know, um, downtown New Orleans on canal, or I'd be in, uh, St. Martin Parish or wherever it was. And they'd have places to clean off your shoes. And he'd always be like, bleach your shoes, bleach your shoes, bleach your shoes. You don't know what's in there. I'm like, well, I do know what's in there. It's dead bodies have been in here. Yeah. Gas is leaked from here. And so Everything. it was like, you shouldn't be, you know, even anywhere near that. I remember I came home, I was able to go on vacation right away, which was amazing to be able to, to, to just sort of disconnect from everything yeah. and decompress. And, and so I'm in Colorado and I got my boots on and he goes, oh, those boots that I had you bleach all the time. I'm like, yeah, you, like, you got to throw them out. I'm like, I got to what? Throw what? I'm not throwing my boots out. He's like, throw them out. And wow. so it was just that whole thing was just such a unusual. Wow. That's one of those things where it's like, how do you even tell that depth of what's going on? It because you oh, probably yeah. still had like a three minute hit or whatever it might be. Right. You can't even you can't even graze the surface of what's and going you're, on. And you're putting like, and, and I'm not saying you're putting your life on the line necessarily, but, but, you are. but it is fraught with peril at the very least. At the very yeah. least. So um, but it was a, it was I, I'm so glad I did it. I do think I had some PTSD. I know it took me a long time to come down off of that. And even though I was on vacation, you know, three in the morning, I'm still, you know, and they're like, oh, you know, oh, okay, I'm here. I'm good. I mean, I think there's probably some of that. I'm not a psychologist, but I, I think there was a, cer a certain level of that because the things of I course. saw and experienced were um, just unbelievable. Yeah. No, I mean, you have to be emotionally attached as a reporter right. to tell the story effectively, right? That's how I feel about it. Yeah. If you're going to be good at anchoring, reporting, anything, you have to have the E gene, empathy. Yeah. Like you yep. can't go to empathy school. They, they don't They don't teach it in journalism school. Hey, mm -hmm. class 302 is empathy. You either have it or you don't. And to me, the best people in the business have empathy. Right, right. Because, because otherwise you have to have empathy, but you can't get emotionally attached to every story because every time you see a mom crying because her loved one, her baby then got killed, I mean, that's the worst thing ever. Like I can't yeah. imagine that. So there has to be a little disconnect there for you to even go on as a human being. That's hard but for some people. to understand if that mom says, I don't want to talk to you and slams the door in your face, don't take it personally. You have to have a little empathy because she just went through the worst thing in her entire life. Right. Right, right. Yeah. All right. Tell me you worked in TV news without telling me you worked in TV news. So I was a story. I love telling people stories. I love meeting interesting people and getting to the heart of an important matter and being able to make it simply understood. So I was a storyteller and the best stories were about people that were interesting. And so mm -hmm. you could talk about all these other sorts of stories with analytics and numbers to back it up and whatever the case is. But at my heart, I was a storyteller and I love telling the, the stories about people who you might not know, they might not be heroes to you, but they were doing something pretty incredible. So yeah. in what you're doing now, is that a piece of advice that you would give to somebody is to like cut through the BS and like just tell the story? Is Every that part day. of I your tell message? People that all the time, all my clients, Megan, 
I'm like, tell a story before you get, go. it just makes you more relatable. So if you're sitting there trying to make a point about something, tell a story that relates to that. And not only does it help open up you and make you, you know, like I've seen CEOs, like, you know, they, they tell that story, they get used to telling a story and they realize that really tees up a great conversation yep. and it, it smile and it opens yep. them up and their body language is better. And they're also relating to their audience Yeah. So no matter where you are. Like, like I do a lot of media training, but the message training at a company with dozens and dozens of people getting on the same page, being able to talk about their company in an authentic, uniform way, there's a lot more work to be done there than there is for like, hey, there's two people at this place that, can, that are allowed to talk to the media. I'll help them and I do all the time. But being able to tell your story, I tell people this all the time, tell your story. You're in finance, you're in healthcare, you're in food service. It doesn't matter what you're in. You got to connect with people clients, potential clients, uh, people that, you know, analysts, whatever the case may be, how do you connect them? Tell a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I do the same thing, Rob, in my job now. And oh, you can, there is data to back it up that when you are, are presenting information to people, even if you just say the words, let me tell you a story, their brains light up because we are hardwired to be like, Ooh, a story. Yeah, yeah. Tell me more. And it's like somebody will say, let me paint a picture. Like what you're doing is painting a picture and, and you're allowing people to sort of visualize something yeah. beyond yeah. the, I want to work for you because I'm, the, yes. you know, we're the best. You're, you're dealing with uh, financial people all the time, Aaron, you know, these financial folks and they're smart. And, and I work with financial people too. And I always tell them, man, when you guys get into the weeds and you start talking about high yield and this and that and whatever, you guys know it. But when you're up here trying to get there and you have to tell a story and be relatable and have people understand what your firm does, what you stand for. You got to tell that story yeah, it's and, an and it's not just, there. you know, here are the numbers yeah. to back it up, but the numbers yeah. do matter. I always yeah. tell the people that too. Yeah. Longest time on air straight. Longest time on air um, had to have been one of our crazy weather things. It could have been <laughs> even at, um, at, at, at the old place, uh, probably eight hours, eight or 10 hours. That's the most I did. How about you guys? What was your, what was your, long, that's Mine the longest was 12 hours. Maybe oh, it's the weather more. person. Oh my God, the blizzard. The whatever. In Miami, the, though. Mine was Miami, a hurricane. Oh, Miami, and, where you have a friggin' hurricane coming. Oh my so God. And what happened was awful because it was like, it was a Hurricane Wilma and it was down by the Yucatan. And we thought it would be approaching Florida within 24 to 48 hours. Okay, right? Somewhere in that range. <laughs> so we went full blown coverage, oh, blow out then, the commercials, oh. you're wall to wall. And the stupid thing stalls for five <laughs> days. <laughs> so that was my story. I was literally like on 12, 12 on, 12 off for five yeah. days. Yeah. Oh, my oh gosh. My God. Yeah. No, I, and, the, and the weird thing is, as a reporter, there were hurricanes I covered in Louisiana where we were on the air a lot longer, but I wasn't personally on the air. I'd be reporting Wait. from then I break down then we go here or whatever. But but continuously was when I was an anchor um, and we were probably doing weather coverage and it was, you know, yeah. You're on, you know, half the day or whatever. Right. And all you and that, have that'd be to see you guys. Maybe <laughs> it would be, be like, it was like, hey, they're going up. from 3 a.m. to to noon. And then Rob, you show up at noon and it'd be like, Hey, the mic. Yep. Aaron, right. good to see you all. I'll see you again in six months. I don't <laughs> yeah. miss that, but I can tell you the very first time that there was a blizzard after I was done in TV and I didn't have to get in my car at midnight in order to get to the station and oh. drive through a blizzard white knuckled, oh, I was yeah. like, oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. All those big moments. And, and listen, you love being where a big story is, or it's a big weather event. That's what kind of defined us for so long. But honestly, with on those days where you had to be there, nobody else had to be anywhere, but you had to be there. I'm so glad I'm not doing that now that it can yeah. be like, oh, it's a bad storm. Oh, it's uh, it's going to be eight inches of snow. And I'm like, well, I can have meetings in my, I can still yeah. do my I job. I will sleep in. For Thank my, you very much. I got to get a snow day for real. Catch on the yes. side. Oh. It's fantastic. I love it. I love every bit of it. Like a gift All right. Every time. Some talent that you learned by working in TV news that you still carry with you that other people can kind of implement in their life. Um, this is going to be weird and you may not have heard this. And I tell people this all the time when I'm working with my clients, I have an internal clock that when it's, when things start dragging, they get going too long, you know, so it could be a meeting, it could be a presentation, it could be whatever the case is. 
So I'm, I'm always, my clock, I, I guess I developed it in this business because you had to have one, right? And you could say, oh, that second one's going on a little long. I think I'm going to move on to something else because it's getting kind of boring. So that's one of the things I can think of that's relevant to this day because mm -hmm. I use it with my clients. Yes. And I'm like, okay, that went on too long. So my internal clock, I don't know if you've heard that answer yet, but my internal clock is still very useful. Oh, do you I want totally us to put agree. you on the spot and tell you to talk about something for 30 seconds? Let's see how um, close sure. you can get. All right, I'll time Megan, it. hold on. You, do you want the topic or timer? I'll time. Okay. I'm going to give you a um, countdown even, Rob. You're lucky this time. Oh, my gosh. Going to think <laughs> hold on. Okay. Um, Come on, who's, who's on the spot here? Is it me or You're anyone? on the spot. I'm going to give you a quick. A quick, a quick yeah. I, oh, because I can't think of anything. You're right. right it's because right. I'm trying to make it light. Um, okay. Light and airy. The weather. No. <laughs> All right. Are, are you ready, Megan and Rob? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so Rob, your topic is um, that we are all holding our pens wrong. You need to hold them with your whole fist now to be ergonomically correct. How's that for a terrible? All right. Idea? So you want, me, you want me to help you through this? Yep. So, yeah. Hold on. Hold I got to count you in, Rob. All right. Okay. In five, yes. four. So I know that we're all used to doing this or some people do this when they're when they're um, when they're holding their pens and that's very comfortable to everybody. But now the, the, the wave of the future is right here, primarily because people don't expect because of, you know, the Internet and everything. Nobody expects handwriting to be very good anyway. So you can always write a little bit. And it, and it looks like maybe a third grader write, wrote it, but nobody has any expectations for that anymore. And as you think about going circular, being able to draw a circle, it's so strong in this, in this form and fashion right here. So because of the fact that nobody has penmanship anymore and the fact that this is such a beautiful, easy circle to draw, I can draw one right here. It works far better than this because nobody expects my handwriting to be good and my circles aren't nearly as, um, as, as strong. Did I, I don't even you know are a time. weather person at heart, I feel, as you have gone <laughs> over, my friend. Um, first of all, <laughs> that was awesome because I teed you up with the worst, <laughs> the worst story anyway. I know, literally, I'm like, great. I did not. And you, know, you know what the worst part is? I hope none of my clients are watching this because I'm like, make your make your initial statement in 15 to 30 seconds. And Megan just said, way to go, Mr. 47 seconds. And I'm like. <laughs> Megan didn't count you down, though, either. I say that's on Megan. Right. Oh, I, my God. I should. I'm sorry. Belly. I forgot to count you down. Was I was seeing if you had that internal. Internal, which was, I oh, always the went internal, over the internal clock. See, so it's good, but it's not, it's not as honed as it used to be. I mean, think about it. See? Like all of a sudden I don't have to sit there and have three deadlines a day. Yeah. Somebody says, can you produce that video in a month? And I'm like, a month? I can produce like you, videos in a month. Did you, you struggle with that? Oh, oh my God. I have a question for you, Rob, because this drives me nuts on a regular basis. Okay. Yeah. For real. You get an email. How much time before you answer that email or you get an assignment or you get something you need to do? How much time before you do it? Because for me, it is like, if the sun sets on something someone has asked, asked me to do, I'm like, <gasps> like, I think it's that TV mentality of get it done. Well, it's, it's, uh, it, I think it's, it's, it's also polite and it's good, you know, good form yeah. to be responding to them in a certain way. So it's not like, Hey, I'm going to get back to that in three hours, but because of the world we used to live in, um, I'm always mindful of advancing whatever conversation needs to happen, whether it's email, whether it's text, whether it's, in, you know, like this. So it's always within a couple of hours. I'm saying, hey, I got it. I'm working on one right now for a client for, for next week. I'm like, hey, let's book this time. I'm going to get you details a little bit later, but we're in. Thank you for what you did, because that's just A, it's courteous. And B, you know, I'm, I'm used to getting things done early and, and not saying, oh, gosh, you have six weeks. Six weeks. This is beautiful. <laughs> does I'll that be set by then. you apart now, though? Like, What's does that? that set does that set you apart? Um, I th I think I think the organizational skills yeah. because of the multiple deadlines a day and the fact that I'm you know the the the, the fact that other people are like oh I'll get to it. <laughs> A lot of people are low energy and I'm like, all right, let's do it. Let's stay organized. Yeah, no. I'm going to write notes like this now. I'm no, like this, Rob. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing notes like this. I'm going to be crap about that forever, Aaron. Like, why did you even come I should have, list, I know, I'm a list I know. maker, I so I'm going to have, have to like redo my list because I'm only going to be able to get like two items on there because they're going to be really big and horrendous looking. Um, so. Real quick, Rob. Uh, yeah. 
we did have tons of fun. This was Look the one time you, you and guys. I sat shoulder to shoulder. This was at, um, the little leaguers winning. Yeah, that I mean, and, and we all know how that story went. But at the time, at the time, they were heroes and Chicago went crazy. It was Jackie Robinson West. Mm -hmm. we we're at Grant Park. We were doing the live coverage. It was super fun. I rarely got a chance to work with you. And so that was great. That was a great time. We had a terrific. Yeah, that was fun. Um, and then this one. Uh, World Series on the field at Wrigley Field for the World Series. No greater place you could be. And then, oh, by the way, they won. That's even better. That's yeah, even, right. A and a couple day. other TV oh, legends. Listen, um, as a hockey guy, loved covering the Blackhawks when they were good. And this was 2015. They won. This was at Soldier Field. Ryan Baker and I were on the air for a long time. And Cheryl Burton, my first co-anchor in Chicago, came over. She was a couple of tables away to say hi. She was doing live coverage, too. So I'm like, oh, that's a cool picture. I uh, got a picture of Ryan and and uh, Cheryl. But Ryan and I always did the like parade coverage and that sort of thing when the Blackhawks would win the Stanley Cup, which they did three times in you know six yeah, years. Yeah. I think what's fun, too, is a lot of people probably don't realize that for those big events, there's general, generally a a media row. So you're, you're side yes. by side with every other station kind of talking over each other, which is always, it's fun. It's a neat atmosphere. It is really fun. And, and it's people you don't get a chance to see a lot. So I always had a great time getting uh, to do mm -hmm. this. And I can't thank you guys enough for having me on. Um, so happy to so talk to you. Yeah. So much fun. So yeah. much fun. So much fun. Well, we hope we you'll come you. back sometime. I will anytime you name it. Um, you know where to find me. <laughs> yes, now we do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Rob Johnson. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. It was Bye, great to be everybody. with you guys. Take care. Best best of luck with everything. Thank Thanks. you. See ya. Bye -bye.